but I think. Okay. So today we have Maria Blanton, and she's a senior scientist at Turk in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And prior to joining Turk, she was a professor of math education at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Her primary research interests include teaching and learning algebra in the elementary grades and classroom practices that support building mathematical arguments. Her research has led to about $13 million in federally funded projects and numerous national and international presentations and publications, including a lot of well-known journals, such as uh, JRME, SM, uh, MTL, and uh, She is co-editor of the research volumes Algebra in the Early Grades and Teaching and Learning Proof Across the Grades, author of Algebra in the Elementary Classroom, Transforming Thinking and Transforming Practice, and co-author of Developing Essential Understanding of Algebraic Thinking for Teaching Mathematics in Grades 3 through 5 and Teaching with Mathematical Argument strategies for supporting everyday instruction. She served as chair of the editorial panel for uh, JRME and chair of the special interest group for research in math education of AERA. So without further ado, I'd like to thank our speaker. Thank you. Well, that was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, I'm not sure if it's reassuring to graduate students, but you even at my age, turned 50 last year, you still feel like a student. So there's a lot that I just don't know. <laughs> so hopefully today I can share a little bit about some of the things we've learned, but um, every answer leads to more questions. Amy and I were just chatting earlier, and we came up with something we didn't know, and we thought about, hey, how can we find an answer to that? So that's sort of what we do, and that's fun. It's, it's a great day job. But um, I want to talk a little bit about whether or not young children can think algebraically. And my guess is most of you in here, if you've been around that question at any point, your answer would be yes, they can. So we sort of know the answer, but I'll try to unpack it a little bit. And I want to look particularly at the case of variable notation. And I know there are a couple of you in here maybe who have heard me talk about some of these things before. So I apologize to that, but if you're like me, the repetition's helpful. Um, but there are some new things in here that I think are worth thinking about again. So we like to, to um, sort of take the show on the road to different audiences and get feedback and get impressions and use the ideas that we hear will sort of push us further in our thinking. So I appreciate that opportunity to be here to do that today. Um, but this is not just my work. It's a number of universities that we've collaborated um, over the last decade in looking at early algebra. So I won't list everybody or say everybody's name, but I'm sure you recognize a lot of folks on that list. Some of you do. Um, so it's definitely not just me that's doing this. Um, back in the last century, that was a long time ago, I was at an algebra conference in Australia, the Ickney Algebra Conference. I'm not sure if you were, were you at that. So there was dinner one night, and we were out, and maybe it was the early algebra crowd, I don't recall, but there was someone seated beside me who said, well, does this really matter? So in other words, all this energy is now being invested in changing how we do the algebra thing at least in the United States. That's, that requires a huge amount in terms of what we do with teachers, what we do with curriculum materials, you name it. It's just a lot of stuff that we're trying to do. How do we know that it matters? Matters meaning the reason we started this process to begin with is because kids were having so much trouble in the formal algebra, algebra one, algebra two, and we looked at things like Tim scores and so forth, and we saw a lot of failure, a lot of marginalization. Algebra came known as, as Schoenfeld uh, described it, the gatekeeper. And so what we want to understand is whether or not it makes a difference if we start in kindergarten, as Common Core tells us to do, if we start there and really develop something over time in elementary grades, will that lead to kids who are more successful later in formal algebra, which is going to widen that STEM pipeline and give more students access to STEM ideas, to STEM fields, to quality of life. Interestingly enough, um, students who score um, uh, see, I, I wasn't planning to talk about this, I don't know the exact details, but they pass algebra too, I think that's largely it. They are going to, they're, it's correlated with earning the top quartile income later in life. So there are some real things to think about in terms of how does this algebra thing matters. So that was a question that was sort of burned into my brain and it sort of crystallized around the issue of what is the impact of doing algebra in the elementary grades? How can we somehow measure that, capture that, and provide some really hard evidence? rather than just, I think it's a good idea, let's do it. But here are the numbers that show this matters. It turns out that was a really um, hard question in terms of actually answering that. It wasn't something we could go do in one grant, but it became part of sort of an overarching set of projects that we call Project LEAD, 
where our goal has been to think about whether a comprehensive, long-term, early algebra instruction in elementary grades really makes a difference in students' understandings of algebraic practices and concepts as they go into middle grades and even in, in elementary grades itself. So that led to, to uh, in, immediately two sort of roadblocks for us. One was, what do we mean by early algebra? So we needed a sense of what we were going to call algebra, how we were going to define it, and so forth. The second really more significant roadblock was, what would such an approach to instruction look like? So what we realized immediately that we could not do is we couldn't go into elementary grades and start testing kids' algebra knowledge because it wasn't being done. So we had to invent the thing that we wanted to measure so we could look at impact. And that's where we started. Defining algebra, so to speak, was really easy for us because that had largely been done prior to um, my coming on the scene as a faculty person way back when, 1998. Um, a lot of folks had really already been thinking about early algebra. And so we were really building on their ideas and trying to extend them and put some flesh on them and really see what it looks like in terms of classroom work. Um, those of you who know me know I work with Jim Kappa, and so obviously this is where we're getting our understanding of algebra from. So he defines algebra as two key aspects, which really are ways of thinking. And those key aspects, he talks about them as, or he talked about them as making and expressing generalizations and reasoning with and acting on symbolic forms. He um, interpreted, as we do, symbolic forms quite broadly. So not just variable notation, but larger things like natural language or graphs, tables, and so forth. But he saw these ways of thinking as happening within content strands, and he identified three strands, and I've highlighted a few of these that might sort of jump out at you, like generalized arithmetic or functions. And so what we then did with his framework is we tried to operationalize it so that we could have something from which we could build a thing we were going to instruct kids around and then measure. And so for us, this became looking at four core practices, generalizing, representing, justifying, and reasoning with structure and relationship. And this is important here because, um, as we were discussing earlier, Amy and I, kids in elementary grades can certainly justify why 3 plus 4 is 7, for example. That's a perfectly good thing to do. But we're not interested in that kind of justification. We're looking at it only in the context of where there's structure, where there are generalizations, where there are relationships, and how do they build arguments around those kinds of things. So from this broad set of practices, we wanted to think about where they could occur in the classroom. And that took us back to Caput's content strands, which we parsed as generalized arithmetic, this messy thing regarding equations and expressions and inequalities, and then functional thinking. There's nothing sacred about this. This is how we chose to divide it. They are consistent with Caput's first two strands, but more importantly for us, they sort of reflected where the early algebra research has sort of crystallized. So when we looked at the body of research, and we had to build from that research if we were going to design an instructional sequence, it was around things like generalized arithmetic. There was already a lot that was known, so that was where we needed to start. And so that's how we came up with those particular domains. Questions so far? Um, so then, there we go. We're now at a place where we wanted to build these tools so we could begin to study impact. So what I'm going to do next is just give you a broad overview of the projects that we have been conducting or have, have conducted that put us in the place where we can measure impact. The first one, and this is grades three through five work, LEAP is what we'll call LEAP one. So with LEAP one, that was really our design process. And in that, we designed a curricular framework and learning goals and instructional sequence. Uh, we developed assessments, which we validated. And then later on, in looking at students' responses to those assessments we did, and they have begun to look at the levels of sophistication they exhibited as they went through our instructional sequence. I'm not gonna get into that any more depth. I'd, I'd be happy to give you a reference if you wanna look at it. Um, but that was sort of what our first task was. What I will say about it is this. I passed out a, um, just give you an idea. So you've got this overview. So what this tells you is for grade three, our, this is sort of a snapshot of our grade three instructional sequence. It gives you the lesson focus, the sequence of the lessons, how many lessons were taught for that particular concept, and the learning goals that were associated with those lessons. But keep in mind, even though we did equal sign at the beginning of the year, relational chain equal sign, this is actually a concept that showed up for three years. So we, every lesson has something called a jump start. So we would have a little piece of that jump start sometimes that might be about reviewing the equal sign. Because we know, and you guys know, that kids are not going to get the equal sign in one lesson. So that's just, just because it shows up in one place doesn't mean those ideas did not reoccur because they did. Okay? 
So I'd be interested in your um, feedback later, Jamie, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you were with elementary teachers. From once we had done this, we wanted to get some preliminary efficacy data, so we did a quasi-experimental study cross-sectional at each of grades three through five, and just collected some preliminary data. Um, that was a small-scale study. There were two classrooms at each of grades, and so we did that and went on from there to leap two. Leap two was a little bit bigger in terms of gathering data well, as to whether or not the instructional sequence works. And in that case, it was longitudinal, um, and we started the cohort in grade three, and we went across grades five with them, teaching them the instructional sequence. But it was quasi-experimental. It was small scale. We had maybe 170 kids in the, in the study, but still it was a starting point. And one reason I want to go through this with you guys, especially graduate students, is you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming, like where do I start with a project? And I can see this only by hindsight. I did not have the foresight when I started this to realize, oh, this is going to go here, 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 and here. I can look back and say, oh, yeah, now that makes sense. Now we're here. And we certainly couldn't have started at point C. We had to start at point A. So if you have an idea that you think is worth looking at and funders agree with you, don't feel like that's the only thing you can do with that idea. Take it, begin it, and start to build on it. And look at the different ways that it can grow. And what's funny is every time we do a project, I always say, well, I just can't imagine what's going to come next. And we get to the end of the project, and lo and behold, there's another one that's waiting right there for us to do. So some of this sort of drives itself, but I, I, can, I think it can be discouraging if you're a graduate student and you wonder, how on earth do I do this? There are a number of projects we've done over the last 10 years, and I can promise you we didn't imagine it ahead of time. So just, again, it starts with, I think, a, an idea that's important, and uh, people who agree with you, and then you go from there. But so we did LEAP 2. LEAP 2B was a follow-up in grade 6 where we looked to see uh, retention. If these kids don't have an intervention in sixth grade, what do we know about how their knowledge changes, control and experimental? Does it grow? Does it, do they equal out? And things like that. I'm not going to talk about results of that study, um, but my, our former doc student, Ishel, has written about that. So. Meanwhile, on the side, because I had nothing else to do, right, with three small kids, um, we, I was working with another colleague at Tufts, Barbara Brisway, which you, some of you may know, and we were interested in going into K through two where not as much work had been done and really beginning to think at a smaller scale <laughs> because grades three through five work was very broad in scope. We want to get down sort of in the nitty gritty of those Amy Ellis type classroom teaching experiments where they're eight weeks or two weeks or three weeks and really think hard about how do kids think about, for example, generalizing, representing with variable limitations, stuff like that. How do we sort of pick that apart and understand those cognitive foundations from the beginning of school? So that work was sort of percolating on the side, but LEAP 2 had to have a successor. And as I mentioned, this was quasi-experimental, which is great, and we found some nice results, which I'll tell you about later, but at the end of the day, everybody wants to know about randomized studies. And personally, it's not my happy place. Um, I am not that much interested in, in quantitative methods. I find great methodologists, and they do it for me. But um, the truth is, we need that kind of data. And while I'd much rather sit and talk with a six-year-old, we need hard evidence. And so our next step was this randomized study, which is ongoing. We actually are finished with the intervention in grades three through five. But we started in 46 schools, half of which were randomly assigned to treatment, half to control. And in those schools, we taught the teachers the intervention, and they went out and implemented it. And so they started in grades three, the grade three teachers. And we followed that cohort of students through grades five. And right now, they're in grade six. And we'll give them, in the coming weeks, a follow-up assessment. So that's sort of where we are with that. The one thing that I like about this particular project is it's a very diverse setting. You've got suburban, rural, urban. 63% of the participants have free or reduced lunch. And so this is a very broad-based scenario. And so this is, this is really our test of whether or not this is going to do well. So let me just give you a little snapshot of our overall findings from that LEAP 2 quasi-experimental longitudinal and the LEAP 3 randomized studies. You can see what happened in general, and then from that we'll dig down a little further into grades um, K through 5 and think about some specific things around variable notation. Are we good? Another thing I want to point out is when I talk about assessments and so forth, these are going to be based on responses to common assessment items that I passed out. So as part of our LEAP 1 work, we developed and validated algebra assessments for each grade. And across those assessments, there are nine common items, and they are listed on this 
set of sheets for you. Sorry, I think about this. It does a variety of things, but in large part, what we're trying to do is measure how kids engage in those four practices, that generalizing, representing, and so forth. Okay, we were really excited with our LEAP 2 results because First of all, at pretest, nobody in control or treatment knew a whole lot about algebra, as we expect, as expected. Moreover, they were all at the same place, pretty much. There were no significant differences. But at the end of grade three, whew, the leap kids, I'll call them leap kids. Wow, they shot way up. Level up a little bit here. We've never understood this fourth grade phenomenon. We've asked various people. We've had principals tell us it happens in all the subjects. And if you look at their standardized assessments, the fourth grade and seventh grade, there's a law. I don't know. But something weird was happening here. But still, things pick back up. So by the end of ninth, uh, sorry, by the end of fifth grade, almost students were overall on the assessment where we scored their assessment correct or incorrect, gave them a score, about 90% correct overall, which is not bad for a third grader, I think, for items like you see. Um, I certainly couldn't have done that in third grade. So we're thinking these kids really can do some of this stuff. This is this is getting interesting. And these differences are significant at subsequent, uh, subsequent time points. So, so far it looks good. Here's our lead grades three through five results. This is the randomized study. We literally just got these results in a few weeks ago from grade five. What do you notice? What? Scores a lot lower. What? Yes, the trends are very similar. So we get this big bump in third grade. We still get significant differences at fourth and fifth grade, but um, the rate of growth is slower. S still, two things to remember. First of all, in our LEAP 2 work, it was taught by a member of our project team who was an elementary classroom teacher who knew this stuff code and who had taught it many times. That's a very different scenario than going into random school districts and teachers may be interested or they may not be interested and into a variety of school settings where there are at-risk populations versus not at-risk populations. And so this was a very different study for us. But even so, what we found is that by the end of fifth grade, almost 60% of those kids, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Student, students were scoring on average at about 60% if they'd gone through the intervention. And for us, that's really good. These are not easy concepts. And keep in mind too, that's only after about 20 hours of instruction a year. So it's not a lot of investment of our time versus what we get back in the results from our opinion. Will we be lucky to be 100%? Yes. That almost never happens. The issue is are the differences significant and how can we improve those differences? So right now we are at the place where we're getting results that we wanted. We also found that teachers who implemented with higher fidelity, their students significantly outperformed those teachers who did not implement the intervention with higher fidelity. So how it's implemented matters. So there are a lot of factors here that we are still unpacking but for right now, the good news, and according to our methodologist at least, these are good results. She's happy, we're happy. Another piece that um, we looked at with this LEAP 3 study is not just their correctness, did they get it correct or not, but did these students use more algebraic strategies? And let me give you an example of what I mean by that. If you're doing an equal sign problem, like 3 plus 5 equals blank plus 4, Kids have different ways they can solve it. First of all, they might not do it correctly at all, which is one scenario. But if they do it correctly, they can reason computationally by adding 3 and 5 and then finding a missing value. Or they can do it by way of what we describe as a compensation strategy, whereas they look and see, oh, gee, 5 is one more than 4, so the missing number has to be 1 less than 3 or something like that, some kind of reasoning like that, where they're looking at the structure and not the computational values. So we were looking to see how students did on items where they could have a structural response as opposed to an arithmetic response. And what we found is that lead kids significantly outperformed control kids in terms of their use of algebraic structure. So that is a really powerful result because it's telling us not only that can kids do that kind of work, they can do it in very successful ways as opposed to those who cannot. So this is an important thing for us to think about. But now let's get back to really what we're here. That's variable notation. How many of you um, study variable notation in kindergarten? Oh, sorry, in elementary grades. When was the first time you saw variable notation? Okay. 
Eighth grade for me. Eighth grade. You're young, so <laughs> you think it changed. Maybe, maybe sixth grade. Maybe sixth grade. There's been a lot of um, conversation about when we should do this and why, uh, or if, even if we should. There have been a lot of people who's all, gosh, we cannot bear. Right? There's, it's, there are reasons for that. So if you look at the research in middle grades and maybe beyond, certainly it is the truth that kids have difficulties with variable notation. We know that. And it's reasonable to think, I'm looking to see if I've got you up here, Amy. I don't. Okay, sorry. But it's reasonable to think that um, if they're having trouble in seventh grade, eighth grade, then it's going to be even worse in first grade, right? That's a reasonable extrapolation to make. There's also the concern of premature formalisms and kids just sort of moving symbols around. That was one of the big problems with Algebra 1. Kids, as, as Jim Cabot used to describe it, there was this extreme focus on the last three letters of the alphabet, but kids not understanding what it's all about. So those are valid concerns, and certainly it's led to, it has led, I, I'm not sure where people are on this now, I know where I am, but why not forgo literal symbols, letters? Why do we even bother? Why don't we just use the representations that are readily available to them like natural language? And we absolutely believe in using natural language in classrooms. Our lessons are built around them. But I want to think a little bit about maybe that's not the best question to ask, or maybe there's, maybe we need to think about variable notation. I like how uh, David Carraher and Alder Schliemann talk about this. They make the case that if you thought about the argument that students should be introduced to variable notation only when they understand or know the meaning of the symbols, if you took that argument and you applied it to first language learning, adults would never speak to newborns on the grounds that infants do not already know what the words mean. From the time you're born, you are bombarded with oral and visual symbols that you have no idea what they mean. Because as you interact with them, you begin to understand and construct an understanding of those symbols. And that's sort of the approach we take with young children. Someone asked me a few years ago, sort of continuing this theme a little further, about this letter. Why would I use a letter? Not this letter in particular, but why would I use a letter with a child? Um, and it was a, it was a perfectly good question to ask. But what occurred to me as he asked that question was, we think that's so complicated, but if we just move it a little bit, we get another symbol that we use readily in kindergarten and we think nothing of it. And I would argue that this is probably more complex than this. And certainly, I think you would agree with me that this is more complex. We know the research that says if you take that X and make it an equal sign, you get something that kids, even in the high school, struggle with. So why is it that we feel like that is really a non-starter for a six-year-old, that we really can't use that type of language with a child? So let's think about what kids are doing. I'm going to look at three areas. Um, and in each of these areas, that's sort of corresponding with our content domains. I want to drill down into what kids are doing, what we're finding about what kids can do, are doing. When we looked at, in our late LEAP 2 study, so we looked at these items, and we focused on those particular items from the three strands, generalized arithmetic and so forth, that required students to generalize and use variable notation and to represent the generalizations they noticed, and also interpret variable representations. So we were looking at particularly at those items where students had to notice and represent with variable notation properties, like the commutative property, or algebraic expressions, or functional relationships. And then they had to interpret two variable function rules. Do we see anything happening with regard to that, this sort of broad scale quantitative approach? No difference at pretest, but at each time point thereafter, lead kids significantly outperformed control kids on their ability to do those types of tasks which specifically involve variable notation. One of the items, I hope I've got mine numbered correctly. Yes. So I'm just picking out those items that really focus in on this issue. Students are given a context and they're asked, if basically they have to recognize the commutative property. They have to explain why they think something is always true, but then they're asked to represent this idea that you can write an equation using letters to represent the idea that you can add two numbers in any order and get to the same result. So this is just one slice of this problem. This doesn't mean they have a rich understanding of variable, it just means this is what they can do. So by the end, at the beginning, nobody can do this at all, not surprising. By the end of fifth grade, almost 90% of uh, lead kids are able to represent with variable notation. Not many of the control kids, although they are learning a little bit by um, fourth and fifth grade. 
But it's always interesting to go back to the little kids and to see what meaning do they make of this? I mean, are they just sort of regurgitating letters? Do they really understand the community of property? Can we say that about a child? And my response to that is basically probably not the way a mathematician does. But I would be willing to bet they understand it as well as some of the folks getting out of high school do. So I don't know. I mean, I've had, I had a mathematician recently tell me after we watched the video I'm going to show you now, he said, wow, I can't get my college students to do that. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. So we're not claiming that kids totally get it. We're saying that here's a starting point. And if we begin to introduce these ideas, by the time they get that complex combinatorial type, type problem with all these ends and everything, that's not such a big deal because they have been looking at it in context for years now. Okay, so just to give you some background here, this is one of our um, K-2 projects. This is in first grade. This is at the end of a 30-minute lesson on the commutative property. And the kids have spent the entire 30 minutes simply looking at trains they build out of stack use and thinking about commutative properties and moving the order of the train around and what does that do to the total number of cubes, thinking about number and operation in the context of that. But that's pretty much it. They've come to a generalization that um, would be basically the commutative property of words. Prior to this, they've had two lessons on additive inverse and additive identity, where, again, through exploration, they come to a conjecture. And in that lesson, they did, this teacher who is on our project team, she did introduce uh, variable notation. We believe you introduce it. We don't believe you sit around waiting for kids to invent it. So that's just where we're coming from. So let me see if I can play you this clip. This is like the last few minutes of class. Usually it doesn't work to play it from a PowerPoint. We'll see. So what do you think about her thinking here? What does she not understand at a six-year-old level? Or what do you get out of this? What's the point, right? Well, she knows that on the same, like if you have two amounts on the left hand and the right hand side of the equal sign, then it stands for the same value, or it represents the same value. You said something really important there, Kristen. Right, okay. We had three <laughs> options this morning. I finally already know the right one. Okay. All right, so you said something really important, and that is she understood on both sides of the equal sign what the value, you know, different letters for different values. Think about the kids you've seen in elementary grades and middle school and what happens when they see an operation on the right hand side of an equal sign. This child is not bothered by this. She's not, she's in first grade. She's barely been introduced to equations, a little bit for sure, but it's not like she's in fifth grade now and she's been seeing them for years. She is not bothered by this. She's not bothered by letters in this, in this um, equation. Um, she understands the syntax of the variable usage, that I need different letters because I want to talk about quantities that might be different. She understands how to show, so I'm switching the order. So there's a lot that's happening here. Does she truly get that A could be any number in the world for her? Possibly, I can't say that she doesn't, but I think that she's got a good starting point for the commutative property. Now we don't want to go in and just give them a property, again, that you miss the whole lesson where they spend a lot of time thinking about it and getting to a conjecture of what happens when you switch the order. But what I want to talk about today is that variable notation piece, that kids can do that. And it actually might be something that they find as powerful as mathematicians do. I'm just going to add yes. something, which is that I'm really interested in children's use of language in mm -hmm. mathematical learning. And it was very clear that she had meaningful language that she owned and could use to represent her understanding. So just even her use of the turnaround fact mm -hmm that she had learned about that and it made sense to her and then she was able to use it in this context to talk about her understanding. And this was fresh. You saw that. I mean, it shocked us. It was fresh in that she wasn't regurgitating. They'd never done a variable representation. This was her connection of what these letters meant in this situation. So you're really right. She's, now, not every child and not every high school student is that articulate. So when we're interviewing kids, a lot of times you'll see another clip of her. We have to get kids who are able to talk about their thinking, otherwise we have a very silent interview, right? But it is the case that she knows how to communicate that idea. So it was really, and really she had had the opportunity to learn yes. that that concept and that language. So maybe the kids that aren't so articulate didn't have teachers that worked with them to develop the ownership of that language that represented yeah. those key concepts. And I don't know the answer to that, but I certainly do believe that the more those classrooms build that, the stronger it can get with students. So 
Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, the other piece is the second E here, expressions. And this is something we're really interested in. We borrowed from tasks by um, Kara Herr, Rizuela, Schlieven, and uh, Schwartz that take a really important idea and that is kids mathematizing an unknown in a problem. So in elementary grades, kids get a lot of problems where you know, Jack has three apples, his sister gives him four more, how many does he have all together? So they're operating on knowns to find unknowns. What they don't often get and what is really difficult for them is mathematizing a situation that has an unknown in it and it has to sit there throughout the problem. So um, this shows up as item five, A through C, where we have Tim and Angela with these piggy banks. We don't know how many are in the banks, but they do have the same amount in their banks. And Angela has eight more in her hand. And so what we just want kids to do is, although it's very basic, it feels like, but for elementary kids, this is a big deal. We want them to understand how to represent these scenarios. Tim's number of pennies, Angela's number of pennies, and their combined number of pennies. And what it makes a child do is it helps them confront that ambiguity that they're uncomfortable with. So they've got to be able to say, okay, I don't have to give a specific value to the number of coins in the bank because that's what they'll normally want to do. Instead, they've got to be okay with, I don't know what I need to call it something. And then I can do things to this something. So, no surprise, at the beginning, nobody can do this. But by the end of grade five, 92% of kids can not only represent Tim's, but importantly, they can, with meaning, represent Angela's. So here we were looking to see if kids, for example, said Tim had X pennies in the bank, then Angela should have X plus eight because they had to account for the fact that they had the same number of pennies in the bank. Um, so a lot of kids could do that. Not so much with control. So the issue is can kids do it and how well can they do it? And is that something that we can begin to introduce in elementary grades? Uh, another thing I know you've seen as you look at middle grades and high school is kids are very uncomfortable, uncomfortable with just an expression like x plus 3. Well, set it equal to something and solve it, right? So we need them to be okay with things like x plus 8 or, or what have you. So when they get to middle grades, it's not a big deal. Let me show you a clip of what this looks like in a first grade classroom. I'm going to show you that same child, and I say that only because I want to know that she's not the only person. She just happens to give good clips to show. But other kids, and I'll prove that, um, were thinking the same way that she was. But let me just go back to our little friend here and see what she has to say about this Madeline candy box problem. So is there any doubt that she understands what her representation means? <laughs> she totally nails it. Um, and just to give you some context, she had had in that, it was an eight week teaching experiment, there had been, um, I believe two lessons, two 30 minute lessons that had similar types of problems where they were beginning to get used to that idea. So, um, so in that sense, she had certainly seen that kind of thing before, but I think what is important is she hadn't seen a lot of it. It's not like we had to do this for a year before finally she can do a problem like this. She can pick it up and go with it. Um, this just gives you an overview, because everybody always says, oh yeah, but she was probably an anomaly. Nobody really could do that. Of the eight kids that we looked at in interviews in that first grade class, this is what it looked like at the beginning for that problem, and this is what it looked like at the end for that problem. So there's some really significant types of growth in their thinking here with their use of variable notation. A few observations. Um, kids could use variable notation in these settings to represent quantities in meaningful ways. They did not exhibit object quantity confusion, which is something that has shown up a lot in the literature where a child might think an X represents an apple and not the number of apples. But as you, she very clearly talked about the number of pieces of candy I have. We were very careful in our instruction that we emphasize this is representing a quantity and not an object. So not sure how that misconception appears in the literature, but we have found that kids certainly can move past it if they even had it to begin with. She understands the syntax um, and they can interpret their symbolizations in the context of the problem that she did with that candy. Last one, functions. And this is what I love. I love function stuff. How many of you are interested in functions? Some of you are in good. Um, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so item 9C, or, or item 9, let's look at that. And personally, I think this is a lot for a, an 8-year-old. This is what an 8-year-old has to go through in this assessment. <laughs> They've got to look at the problem scenario, figure it out, and it's not a hard problem for us, but think like an eight-year-old, eight -year okay? They've got to organize their information in a table, which a lot of kids control and experimental are pretty good at. They've got to talk to us about relationships they see, and we want us to tell them what relationships they see in words and variables. So that's what we're looking for. And then, you know, can you use that rule to look at larger or further data down the road, things like that. 
And later in grades four and five, but it's not this because it's not a common item across three grades, we do things like what if you had people sitting on the ends of these tables? So changing it up like that a little bit. So at the beginning, pretest, nobody can do anything by way of words or variables with this particular rule. By the end of fifth grade, 67% of kids are able to represent the rule with functions, sorry, with variable notation. It's compared to only 20, 21% of control kids. So huge growth in what lead kids are able to do. But what else do you notice about this graph? Which we were not expecting. Variables and words. That surprised us in a good way. Even control kids, it's not a big difference, but still, even control kids, when given the choice, are more successful at variable notation than words. So that to me is like, wait a minute, let's stop and unpack, let's think about this a little more. Maybe this is actually a tool that's helpful for them, as opposed to saying, well, gosh, they can't do that, let's don't dare put a letter in front of them. Maybe it's a way that they can access ideas um, that's very powerful for them. Maybe it was just an easy, easy item. So those lead kids who were doing 67% got the rule right, maybe this is really easy, right? So we looked at it in leap one, way back when we were validating our assessments. We looked at the lead kids pre-test and post-test compared to 6th and 7th graders. They're holding their own, even though they're only 8 years old. And this is how they did when they did it with um, variables compared to 6th and 7th grade. So again, they're pretty good, pretty good at this stuff. The last video clip I want to show you is from a K-2 functions project where we went in and did um, an 8-week teaching experiment, two lessons per week, about 45 minutes. And this is the same kind of problem as the Brady problems on this test. Instead of kids sitting at a desk, this is a train that picks up two cars at each stop. Same idea. We don't count the train engine at the beginning, and we go through and we want the kids to finally be able to talk about a representation of what they find. So generate the data, organize it in a table, find a rule, and so forth. So let's take a look at what this, how this child thinks. What do you think she's going to be able to do? So I gave you a piece of paper that has the stuff that she's writing on it. So as she's writing down, you may want to follow along so you can see where she goes. That might help you a little bit with understanding what she's saying. Okay, and I'm going to stop it there, although she goes on to talk more about um, the particular representation she has. But let's just step back a little bit and think about um, what she's doing, um, what her understanding's about re relative to variable notation. Anything that stands out to you? I was wondering why she didn't want to, she wanted to put the R at the bottom. Like maybe one, two, three, and four should be new. So those R can be one of those. Three. Yes. It, and something else. And so I think she said because you had to, so in her mind, you needed to start at the top, like with one, two, three. And so that was something that, you know, we, in the interview, that was the first time I'd seen that. So, um, it's okay that she puts it at the bottom, but she could certainly put it at the top. But that would be like one of those things now that we've gone through and asked for that. We know, okay, a child might start to think that you have to put it down at the bottom somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so we need to make sure we address that in instruction. But she did seem to have that notion about it. That's a good, good observation. I was curious if she just knew her number facts. Like, she, could, she had played with these practical ones. One plus one is two, two plus two is four. Or if she was really seeing that it's two per stop, there's a difference in how she was thinking about it in that sense. Right, and she did double the 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like if she could still know that 100 plus 100 is 200, like if she just generalized her rule that it's just the number Eight of stops plus, plus the number of stops. Yeah. As opposed to twice the number right. of stops. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's a good point because they are in first grade, so we can't do twice the number of because they really haven't gotten into multiplication. So what they do a lot in first grade though, are number facts where you're doubling numbers. So we actually designed it to tap into that particular thing that's going on in first grade because they would, the arithmetic would support the functional thinking. So um, one thing that's true too is some 
function tasks uh, lend themselves to the representation actually models the problem situation well. I'm thinking of the string problem. That's one where you can see a lot about that that's about, that connects well to the representation. What she's clearly doing here is looking at relationships in numbers in a table. We think they're both valid mathematically. Some people say, well, you're not really doing math unless you're doing something from a purely modeling perspective. And I would argue that many of the problems in middle grades and high school don't start with context. And so we want kids to be able to see that structure, even if it's just a set of numbers in a table. Um, notice that she does not say the rule is um, add to. Now going into this, we thought kids, especially in kindergarten, would just be able to see a recursive pattern, and that would be it. So they really shocked us because, and even bigger than that, our hypothesis was that they do recursive thinking in first grade, second grade maybe, because that was a necessary sort of precursor to correspondence thinking. Turns out they actually skipped that all together. They just went straight to correspondence thinking. That was a real surprise for us. Yes, uh, well, and, well, it, once we realized they sort of didn't need to do a lot of recursion, we, didn't, we took it out. So yes, it did ultimately reflect the instruction, but it wasn't originally designed that way. What's interesting to me is, although you did sort of prompt her to do it this way, but she does something that we see in the middle school and high school a lot with students who are far less confident with variable, which is like a middle schooler might say R and V mm -hmm. instead of, and a different middle schooler would do what we would expect, which would be like R and R plus R, right? Or R and two R, not yep. first grader. Even right. I mean, like, you know, typically it's very useful mm -hmm. to express everything in terms of one variable. Yes. And um, in this case, you kind of, I think, it makes sense that she did that, especially because you said, can you write an equation? Right. Like, right. R and v, but, but we see that trace up into older students, even when it's a pretty, like, unhelpful way to do it and it just got me wondering like what is it about those students ways of thinking with variable that they're just not comfortable saying like r plus r they have to introduce a whole new variable even though they can simultaneously do that extra step of telling us oh well v is r plus r but they know that and, and that actually raises i think a bigger issue which we found as well where um and it sort of goes back to what is it about the task where they're thinking that they all sort of exhibit that. So one thing is, we notice with verbal notation is that young kids would do what we call the alphabet strategy. So they might say, well, um, I'm gonna use the letter B, and so that means the value is two. Yeah. You're shaking your head because you've probably seen the research or been part of the research yeah. that says it shows up in older kids as well. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter what point you start at. Kids sometimes exhibit those same types of misconceptions regardless, even as early as first grade. Yeah, and this is an interesting one because it's not a misconception it's just an extra step. Like it's more cognitively demanding mm -hmm. to say, like I'm going to introduce this new variable, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to have this other thing on the side that relates the two. Um, and it just, I, I don't know what that indicates. But don't you think that we most often, when we're talking about variables, we introduce more than one variable? We sure. Don't, we don't really t talk about just R plus R or. Well, it depends, right? So like when we get to algebra and beyond, we do tend to do a lot where it's useful to represent things in terms of the extent variable, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it is true that it might be also this feature of like elementary instruction mm -hmm. where they've done a lot with exactly what she's doing here, yeah. Another thing that she does is she writes the rule as an equation and I do ask her like you said I asked you to write an equation but um, one of the concerns we've had is that we, a lot of times when you ask kids for a rule they give you plus two or double even doubles but they don't see that this is a complete thought that they need to say there are two things that are being compared and they need that precision that allows them to compare two quantities in some relationship so um, again part of it is for us at this point is existence proof these kids can articulate that way they can use variable notation she I, I think I would be a little concerned um, that she, because she said it had to match. So she is looking to see the structure, which is good, but maybe she doesn't really understand what the, she's just getting things that match. So she's using two letters and a different letter, and that's just a matching thing. The reason I think it's a little deeper than that is, is on her own, she realizes that if I add the engine, it changes everything. She did not have to go back and construct a new function table, refine or re 
look for, look for again the, um, the rule, she's able to build on that function that she's created as an object. So that to me tells me she's got something going on there that's, that is not perfect, but if you build on it, by the time they get to middle school, um, Maria, yes. Did she add the one to the R plus R then statement as well? She so did. Like written work looks yes. like she did that. You'll see at the very top here. Yeah, there was that a plus one there. Yeah, plus one. Then she went back and put a, a um, no, she did not, but she wrote it as plus one R plus, but she meant yeah, we're adding one to the R plus R. It's just cool because you see an R plus R as at least somewhat of a number uh, or a quantity, which is just fascinating yeah. at the age relative to students. You know, we often work with the high school and college level. Yeah, it is because it's like she sees that as an object. That's the thing that I can have one to. Yeah, she sees that as a point that yeah. you can actually yeah. perform quantitative operations. Yeah. Just so you'll get a sense, we had not planned to even do that. What if you add the engine with, with first rate kids? Because we, we was like, oh, they can't do this. There's no way. So they always surprise you. Um, and I know I'm almost out of time. I want to say one thing really quickly. This is sort of goes back to my original question. And I think I shared this in Germany, so you guys forgive me for repeating this. but. One of the things that um, really cemented my view on this, and that is why we should introduce variable notation early on, is not just because children can do it, um, but in thinking about at-risk populations, and as I shared previously, um, I'm gonna set this up this way, informal case study, eight-year-old dyslexic student in third grade doing Project LEAP. So he's going through our instructional sequence, and I wanted to see what he would do with this. You know, we're going to get the variable. And this is a child who, a few weeks before this, is, he's in third grade and he's using his fingers to figure out nine plus four, okay, in third grade. And wisdom of practice would say, don't dare bring a variable in, right? Okay, so we got to um, additive identity. What happens when you add zero to a number? He had looked at some computational work and he came up with a conjecture, which we wrote down. And so I said, Sometimes mathematicians will use a number, or sorry, a letter to represent a number whose value they don't know, or they're talking about any sort of general number. If we did that here, could you write this conjecture with variables? Now, what you've missed here is the agony this child went through to write, as a dyslexic child, to write that sentence. Really difficult. He wrote this down in just a few seconds. Like, wow, okay. I said, can you write it a different way? He flips it all around. Okay, okay this is going to get it. So, all right, so I read this long problem to him. I don't really need to be the issue here, so I read it to him. Jenna has 38 pencils. Her mother gives her some more pencils. The next day, Jenna gives her friend Mark the pencils. Her mother gave her, write an equation that represents this. And then you were done for the day. He thinks about it in a few seconds and writes it down. And the one thing that was just like, wow, I can't believe he did that. The one thing that really got me was when we did the commutative property lesson next, he had to first of all talk about it in his own words, and I asked him to write it down. I finally said, don't worry about it, because he was about to cry. He said, this is too much. I can't do it. I said, just write it in variables if you can. He wrote it down. Wow, okay, something's happening here that I need to back up and think about. Um, there's a book I was reading at the time called The Dyslexic Advantage, and it talks about how sometimes children with learning differences are uniquely positioned to learn in ways that kids who are not maybe, or who don't have dyslexia or other learning differences, who are not able to think. Let me say it that way. So it got me to thinking was there's something that I'm missing here about uh, variable notation. Is it, is it possible that there's a dyslexic advantage, at least for that group of kids? Is it possible that we actually do students a disservice by not introducing variable notation? Not only, yeah, sure they can do it, we, let's bring it in as gravy but you actually might be hurting them because you don't give them a tool that's really powerful and it lets them very succinctly put an idea out there in a way they can represent pretty easily. So that to me was a real aha moment. Um, and the part that I like the most is that's my son, Jackson. He's now 10. But that really taught me something. And actually, we just got a grant last year where we're taking our work down in K through 2, but that grant is focused on, and I talked to a person about that, is focused on kids with learning differences. How do we help them? Um, we put another grant in, hopefully we'll get funded to work with working with some colleagues of mine at Turk who do game design. And so we're looking to see, can we design games around the equal sign using iPads? So they're physically, kinesthetically acting out balance. And how does that help them? And can we develop assessments that will better measure what kids who can be marginalized, who look like they can't do it, and who are sort of forgotten in some ways, 
can we help those kids show us that they really understand this in different ways? And so um, this is a whole new area of work. I'll be quiet and listen to you guys. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, might take one question. If there's anyone who wants to talk, she will be downstairs um, until she leaves. I guess. Sure. I have to scoot out. Oh yeah, absolutely. I was. How did you get 46 schools? That's <laughs> <laughs> like yes. Into 46 teachers. A miracle. Yeah, seriously. Like, like, how do you do it? How do you do it? I will tell you specifically what happened um, that led to this because I think that's really complicated to do. I was asked to go give a talk um, at SAS in Raleigh, which has nothing to do with back then, but they host, I think it's called the Triad High Five, but it's like five school districts in the Raleigh, re the research triangle area. Five school districts that come in with this massive, um, L let's see, it's KA, I believe, and it's STEM focused. I don't, I don't think it's just math, but I was asked to go in and talk to elementary teachers about, or principals, district, you know, district administrators, and so forth, about early algebra. So I went in, this is like in August of 2014, something like that, and I, I gave a presentation on algebra, and I said, now we're about to submit an IES grant, and we need some schools to participate, but do you want to do that? Superintendent are lined up. So I got three districts from that, and we have um, 46 schools in those three districts. So, thank God, I know, it's like, so go talk to Sarah. Sarah's okay, Sarah, 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 seriously. Um, because that is really hard, to, and to get them to stay, and we are now collecting our, our uh, grade six data, fourth year, and at this point, every one of them is still involved. No schools have dropped out. We're, we're randomizing the class, uh, sorry, at the school level, so we still have every school that over years. That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it may never happen again, right? But, okay. Okay. Um, We'll just end it here formally. We can stay around here if you guys want to ask questions or um, if there's a small enough number, we can go to the room. Okay, sure. Thank the speaker. Um, thank you, Marie Blanton. Thank you. Thank you. What do you have on the teachers about? It seems like the kids are doing such great things, but the working with the teachers, they must.